Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, and today in the, re the arena, we're going to be checking out, basically, say that you went to your pre-release, right? And you took the cards that you drafted from your new core set 2020, and you threw them in a shoebox. Well, I'm gonna sift through that shoebox a little bit today, and I'm going to look for some cards that might make a difference in the upcoming standard and other constructed formats. So we're just going to be going over a handful of different cards and what might be good. If you like watching things in order, I've already covered the Elemental Knights. I've already covered the Planeswalkers. I've already covered the standout sideboard cards. You may want to go back and watch parts one, two, and three of this series first, because this one is just going to jump around between a variety of cards while ignoring cards I've already covered. If you don't mind your stuff being a little jumbled, go ahead and watch. Before we dive right in, a quick bit of housekeeping. I want to thank my new sponsor, Esports Gold. Esports Gold is run by gamers providing esports data and content to fans. They just launched a content creator program to help support content creators they want to see grow. I was selected, I'm very honored, and you should check the link in the description to check them out. I don't get any kickback or anything like that from anything that you do with their website, but you should just go click that link and see what they're about, see if it's the kind of stuff and data that you're interested in in the world of esports. Moving right along, we also of course still have the booster box giveaway going on with Flipside Gaming, so I'm going to throw it over to me telling you about them about that giveaway, and then we'll get right into the card reviews. Hey guys, let's take a quick break to talk about Flipside Gaming's core 2020 booster box giveaway. From now until July 15th, you can win an entire box of M20 for free if you follow these steps. Number one, find $10 or more worth of stuff at flipsidegaming.com that you like. Easy. They have singles, they have sealed product, and they have all the gaming supplies you need. So, number two, use the promo code CGB before checkout. This saves you 10% and it supports the channel at the same time. Number three, complete your order. That's it. Even a mono red player can figure it out. <laughs> Please check out the links in the description to read the giveaways, rules, and conditions. And thank you for supporting the channel. May the best mage win. And welcome back. We're going to kick it right off with talking about Brought Back, which is a white and a white for an instant rare. Choose up to two target permanent cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Return them to the battlefield tapped. So bringing them back tapped is a, a very interesting clause to throw on this as it keeps you from creating certain infinite loops. But for the most part, when it says permanent cards, some permanent cards don't care if they're tapped. A few immediate ideas of what you can do with brought back involves history of Benalia that's gone to its final chapter. Bring it right back, start the night train all over again. How about Teferi, Hero of Dominaria? So let's say that you play a Teferi and hit the plus one button. The opponent might respond while you're tapped out to Assassin's Trophy your Teferi or do something rude of that nature. At end step, you untap two lands, and if you set a stop on your end step, you can pay two white mana, cast brought back at instant speed, Teferi comes back onto the battlefield. Tapped which looks really funny when they do that with Planeswalkers. But those are just a few applications for this card, and neither of them really taking full advantage of the card, because, uh, I mean, unless you did this on the same turn, if this went off and you played this and it got destroyed and you brought back both, that would be freaking gross. But uh, really, the situations are kind of unlimited. There's a lot of spots where when something gets blown up, you would want to bring it back and possibly find a way to bring another thing back. Think, for example, if somebody blew up your Ixalan's Binding to release their Benelish Marshal, then attacked with a bunch of creatures, you blocked with some creatures, traded some things, then played Brought Back, bringing back Ixalan's Binding, taking out the Benelish Marshal, and bringing back something that you blocked with. So... It's easy to formulate situations in your head for this card. The question I keep wondering is, is it 
just worse than a negate or Dovin's Veto that would keep bad things from happening to your cards to begin with. I think that some of the situations I just brought up do, do explain how it can be more versatile than that. You don't have to play this when the spell is on the stack. You can play it at the end step at some point, which can matter a lot, especially with an untapped clause like Teferi over here. So there might be enough situations for this to actually find a home. There are some other nutty uh, combinations in the format. We'll get to Lotus Veil s later, but anything that forces you to say sacrifice a few permanents brought back can bring those permanents directly back. This with Priest of the Forsaken Gods can either bring back your priest or the creatures that you sacrifice to your Priest of the Forsaken Gods, which is pretty neat. I'm not sure that this will be part of a tier one strategy because all the time we're setting up these situations and maybe those situations aren't what the game's key moments are about. It's hard to tell in a new format and in especially something as kind of aggro and just curve out centric as standard where you fit the two mana in to pull off these crazy turns. But it's something we have to play with and just something that we have to experiment with. So I'm looking forward to trying out Brought Back. Probably going to try to pick up one or two copies and if this is the card that appeals to you you should know right away you should be reading this going ooh. and if you're going to do that i would pick up two copies and just see what kind of situations you can get yourself into if it's good you can go for more if it's just not like if it's more frustration than it's worth you can probably move on to something else the next card I'm going to talk about is God's Willing. God's Willing is one white for an instant. Target creature you control gains protection from a color of your choice until end of turn, scry one. Hmm. We talked about protection in the sideboard video. It is really hard for me to even attempt to put into words and explain how much more powerful giving a creature protection from a color of your choice is compared to a giving it indestructible, uh, like the card um, Sheltering Light. No, not Sheltering Light. I always goof this one up. Uh, but anyway, the current card in the current instant in the Feather deck gives indestructible, and that doesn't save it from exile, and it doesn't save it from a, a lot like a number of other like weird situations. But exile is the biggest one. But it doesn't make it unblockable, that's for sure. God's willing, giving something protection does make it unable to be blocked by creatures of that color. So the potential for an unblockable, like humongoid 10th District Legionnaire is a completely different situation from what the Feather deck has had access to so far. I think it's pretty clear that God, God's willing should slide right into the Feather deck. It's It existed in the, the heroic deck the last time that we visited Theros and was a key, key, key player in that deck. And it will be extra saucy with Feather the Redeemed and the 10th District Legionnaire. This deck is arguably going to be one of the stronger ones coming out of this M20, this Core Set 2020 uh, card pool. And one of the big reasons is God's Willing. And in fact, it may in fact be the, biz b the biggest reason. It is quite possible that all this deck really needed was a little bit of God's Willing to push it over the edge, as now, it, much like a curious obsessed creature being protected by dive down feather and 10th district legionnaire protected by god's willing is a clock that must be dealt with immediately or the game is effectively over however unlike with curious obsession where the opponent could in theory draw blanks or just draw the wrong cards see their creature die and then proceed to lose the game this game uh, in Boros with God's Willing, Feather, and 10th District Legionnaire is going to end very quickly because you can't block or remove these creatures anymore and they're going to hit you really freaking hard. So God's Willing is without a doubt going to be a player making Feather and 10th District Legionnaires players as well. The golden it, It's like the team got together. The Golden State Warriors are here. Durant and Durant is here. We're making NBA references now. I should stop. Not everybody watches the NBA, but basically we got our all-star team together now. The band is going to go out and going to crush it. Next, we're going to talk about Planar Cleansing. Destroy all non-land permanents. This card is a throwback to Duels 2015 for me, where I played a lot of it, and I also played it in Standard the first time it was printed. And the card usually does see more play than you might expect for a six-mana sweeper. 
And in this standard in particularly, it's a welcome addition because we have a planeswalker problem in this format. Sarkin the Masterless incentivizes a whole bunch of planeswalkers coming down. So yeah, when the opponent gets a board of two or three planeswalkers, we have a way to punish it that isn't the Elder Spell. That's pretty important. However, I'm not sold on Planar Cleansing absolutely taking over the format or being a must play or anything like that. It is six mana, and Star of Extinction hasn't seen much play despite the abundance of Planeswalkers around. Planar Cleansing also does not destroy permanents that are lands, even if they've been turned into creatures, such as with Nyssa, who shakes the world. So while your Planar Cleansing on six mana wipe, might wipe out Nyssa, and Sarkin and all the other friends, the creatures that Nissa turn made out of the lands are still there and might just attack you to death while you're playing your six mana sorcery and waiting for your next untap step. So keep that in mind. I'll probably craft one or two planes or planar cleansings to try out in Esper Control because I absolutely hated if I would fall too far behind with that deck and just feel like the game was over on turn like four or five or something because my opponent had two planeswalkers and i had none um but maybe the elder spell should just be holding it down in that deck what other decks could use a card like planar cleansing is there a naya ramp something with enough white mana that also goes big enough on mana i guess we'll have to see it's not standing out to me but it's an important and notable card to have in the format you're not going to want your first experience with planar cleansing being your four planeswalkers and six creatures getting swept up by it so keep it in mind the next card i'm going to talk about is Sephara, the sky's blade for white 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 legendary creature angel rare you may pay white and tap four untapped creatures you control with flying rather than pay the spell's mana cost flying lifelink other creatures you control with flying have indestructible so there is a, a serious flying theme between blue and white in core set 2020 which makes sense as those cards have been like like those colors have been pushing the flying theme forward for some time but Sephara sky's blade might be one of the ultimate payoffs paying one white and tapping four untapped creatures with flying to pay this card uh, is pretty massive and it does enter the battlefield untapped which means you if they can't re if the opponent can't instantly remove it you immediately stabilize the battlefield with a 7-7 flying lifelink angel which is pretty epic and I think that it's worth noting some of you saying, well, how do you get four untapped flyers? This isn't that different than many things that would happen with Venerated Loxodon. It's, in fact, it's the same cost as a Venerated Loxodon would be that pumped four creatures. So one white and then four other tapped creatures. So I don't think that's too unrealistic. And we introduced a lot more flying threats. I put a couple here on screen for you. Spectral Sailor is one blue, one one flash, flying, and for four mana can draw a card, one of them blue. It's a spirit pirate. Um, another one mana flyer to go with uh, the little drake guy, Petrodon, Pterodon, Ter Storm Tamer Siren is still out there. All those low flyers you saw in mono blue and in mono white. Healer's Hawk, Rustwing Falcon uh, still in the mix. If you want some flyers in your life, Tomic is there. There's, yeah. So there's a lot of cheap flyers in blue and white, and there's a new way to pump them. Empyrean Eagle is one white and blue for a bird spirit 2-3 flying. Other creatures you control with flying gets plus one, plus one. I think it's also worth noting that Supreme Phantom is still in the format. Let me bust that one out here for you. There we go. So Supreme Phantom is also a flyer, is also a spirit, and gives other spirits you control plus one, plus one. For only two mana, it's a one, three from M19. So these will only be together for a limited of time, so get them while they last. But look at this curve right here. Sailor, Phantom. Eagle, so much flying power and toughness. If you throw in the following turn, if you can play any other flyer, probably best would be a second eagle, then you can pay one white and tap this one, two, three, and your freshly cast flyer four and play the Sky's Blade. I, it's a lot of power. Uh, it potentially, that, that curve potentially even holds open counter magic or God's willing. So all of that is pretty 
it, it's compelling. It is going to struggle against the right mix of early removal. Can a red deck just burn all these and keep you from ever playing the Sky's Blade? Can your deck be built in such a way that it reaches seven mana anyway without paying too huge of a cost? I'm not sure that the Safara Sky's Blade thing is going to be the ultimate payoff. The other flyers that you can build around and just have an awesome uh, kind of Sky's approach, maybe Spirit Tribal, might just be good enough there on their own without needing the payoff from the Sky's Blade, or maybe this is the card that pushes it over the top. I wouldn't be surprised if it was regulated to, relegated to the sideboard though. Um, craft one or two, try out the flyer deck if you are really into it and see just how it pays off to maybe play this for one mana and hold open counter magic or god's willing or some instant speed effect of course this card versus teferi time raveler is probably going to feel really bad but if they play their time raveler and you have four creatures on the board you'll be able to fly over kill it pretty quickly and then try this again so eh Eh. It's an exciting card. The amount of power and toughness for the cost of one mana and tapping four creatures is really inspiring. But will the play patterns work out? We're going to have to see. The next package I'm going to discuss here is a little reanimation package. Let's start with Blood for Bones. Three and a black to sacrifice an a as an additional cost to cast this sorcery spell, which is an uncommon by the way, sacrifice a creature. Return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, then return another creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So, it's a reanimation spell, it's four mana, they used to have these, it was called Zombify back in my day, and yes, you get to bring things back for four mana, it was determined too strong. Too strong. It would bring back giant elder dragons and do nonsense like that on turn four with the help of a card called, uh, I think it was, was it Careful Study? No, Compulsive Research. I think that was it. Draw three cards, discard two. You discard your big fatty, you play Zombify, have it back on turn four. In Esper, which was actually a really fun play pattern for Esper. Now, what does Blood for Bones work with? Well, uh, what kind of large things with cool enter the battlefield effects or just generic size would you want to get back? Of course, we have Block a Worm, and you can probably name some other very large creatures you'd want to do. But one that I like is Agent of Treachery. For five blue blue, this is a human rogue rare 2-3, and when it enters the battlefield, gain control of target permanent. Now, there is no clause here that says until Agent of Treachery leaves the battlefield. It's yours. Keep it. At the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more permanents you don't own, draw three cards. Now that's that's extra gravy. But getting to play a card like this for four mana is pretty gross. Gaining control of target permanent with blood for bones is pretty amazing. But it's also a little bit of self-fueling. So say that you sacrifice a creature and you get to return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand and put a creature card onto the battlefield. Let's get an Agent of Treachery, steal something from the opponent. Let's sacrifice the Agent of Treachery to our next Blood for Bones to get something else and then put the, and then just kind of loop it. We'll just sack this to do our next thing and then we'll get it back with our next thing and just, let's, let's do lots of Agents of treachery with Blood for Bones. We need to get these things into our graveyard. So Gorging Vulture is a new print that you may want to take advantage of. It is a common. It's two and a black for a 2-2 two -two flyer, bird. And when Gorging Vulture enters the battlefield, put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. You gain one life for each card put into your graveyard this way. So this is a good enabler. Four is a great number. Glow Spore Shaman, Stitcher Supplier, hitting three cards. They would often miss creatures or what you needed in the graveyard altogether. But getting up to four and possibly five with Knight of Thorns, which is another card that we've uh, talked about in a previous video, that is really self-milling yourself, really getting there. And maybe Tamio needs to be in the mix too to keep the Blood for Bones agent of treachery loops coming. But I like Gorging Vulture for filling the graveyard and giving you a body to sacrifice to your Blood for Bones to get your first big haymaker out of the yard and to keep refilling the graveyard. So some nice little role players here to work with the Blood for Bones. Uh, it makes me think that a reanimator strategy might have a shot. And you have to make sure that you're playing reanimator cards with immediate battlefield impact. You don't want to play a card that gets bounced by Teferi Time Raveler and leaves you sad. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Treachery though, target permanent. That includes land. I can steal their land. 
Oh my god. How much do we want to go stealing their land? Tell me in comments. Are you up for stealing some freaking land? Not just landlording, like hostile land takeovering. Yes. In for it. The next card we're going to talk about is the Knight of the Ebon Legion. Our new buddy Sorin, who we covered in a previous video, needs some friends to hang out with. So for one black, we have a Vampire Knight Rare 1-2. For two and a black, Knight of the Ebon Legion gets plus three plus three and gains death touch until end of turn. At the beginning of your end step, if a player lost four or more life this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the Knight of the Ebon Legion. Just a reminder, damage causes loss of life. Alrighty, so here we go. What do we do with this card? I, I find this reminder text a little confusing when it says that damage causes a loss of life because it also makes sense to me that if you pay life, that is a loss of life too. So uh, like when Adana Vanguard says pay for life, Adana Vanguard gains indestructible until end of turn. Will the Knight of the Ebon Legion gain a plus one plus one counter? It feels like it absolutely should. Like 100% feels like it should, but does it? The parenthesis reminder text is that instead of paying life or is that in addition to paying life, damage causes loss of life? Does it seem that beginner friendly? I This is a core set. They're supposed to be a little bit beginner friendly, but I think that it does gain a counter. And I guess when I find out in Magic Arena, also judge, can we have a judge in the chat? Will this gain a plus one plus one counter when you pay for life with the Dono Vanguard on the end step? Judge. It's also important to note at the beginning of your end step, not at the beginning of each end step, like uh, I believe Paladin of Atonement is a card that worked at the beginning of each end step. This is only on your turn. So on your turn, you'll want to pay the life with a Danto and get in there and get aggressive, and then you can grow your Knight of the Ebon Legion. Another card that might be really good for growing the Knight of the Ebon Legion is Gideon Blackblade. It, it does become a 4-4 that's indestructible. Opponents rarely want to throw any creatures in front of or under the bus. It can get in there while also giving lifelink, vigilance, or something like that to your Knight of the Ebon Legion or your Danto Vanguard, and probably hit the opponent and pump this up. So where four is the magic number, Gideon lines up pretty well. This card really, though, wants to play with the new Soren. New Soren is looking for cards to hang out with him, and you can cheat him into play. You can pay one mana to play him and then use the pump, but on turn three, you can also cheat him into play with Soren's minus three and have the three mana available to turn this into a four or five death touch on defense. I don't know if that's really going to be a thing or not, but it's an option. And I do like that this card can grow itself when you have three extra mana around. This is a pretty helpful member of the Vampire Clan. It might be a little bit better in a deck like that than a Sky March or a Spirenth, which just trades or dies, uh, and probably hangs out with cards like Vicious Conquistador to help you flip your legions landing on time. So I'm a fan of the card. I'm probably going to craft four of them for my Vampire deck right away because I believe that the, he'll turn out to be a pretty good dude. I don't know if he'll be top 10 cards in the set or anything like that, but it'll be a good a good hand for the vampires. Legion's End is a brand new removal spell. One black, sorcery, rare. Exile target creature and opponent controls with converted mana cost two or less and all other creatures that player controls with the same name as that creature. Then that player reveals their hand and exiles all cards with the same name from their hand and graveyard. So. This card is a very narrow sorcery speed, two mana play that gets rid of things that cost two or less, which isn't always helpful, especially when you're facing down a gruel, a gruel spellbreaker, a goblin chain whirler, things like that. But it does have some very narrow applications. For example, would you like to exile their growth chamber guardian, all the other growth chamber guardians in play, and all the other growth chamber guardians in their hand to stop that nonsense? Now you can. How about a Hydroid Crassus that just drew another Hydroid Crassus? You exile the one on the battlefield and you take out the one in their hand. Pretty sweet. So it has applications that can turn around a game that was otherwise probably going to spiral out of control as the amount of value that opponents get from Chaining Growth Chamber Guardians or Hydroid Crassi is just tremendous. So it has its uses. The problem is 
how often will they come up versus how often will you need that early removal spell to keep something terrible from happening. It's also great that it hits a Danto Vanguard because it says Exile. And red decks use a lot of four ofs, so hitting their Steamkin and the Steamkin from their hand will feel great. This might be a very playable card, but I think I would start by crafting two and trying them in the flex removal slots of a variety of decks like Esper Control, like Grixis Control, Blue Black, things like that, and seeing just how often, like you have to track, how often should this have been a cast down? How often should this have been a lava coil? And I would have been so much better off. Versus how often did I totally blow out their chain of awesome value plays with my Legion's End? So I like this card, don't go overboard with it. Try it out, maybe it will have a home in the new format. Next up is Rotting Regisaur. This is two in a black for a zombie dinosaur rare. At the beginning of your upkeep, discard a card, seven, six. Wow, it's so big. No, that's a zombie. <laughs> Yeah, um, if they if they can have zombie dragons, they sure can have zombie dinosaurs. Two relevant types too, dinosaur and zombie, they're on the list. So it can play with other zombie cards like Death Baron, but it can also be fetched by Commune with dinosaurs in the dinosaur deck. You can play this on turn two with Llanowar Elves, just as something you might want to try out. Now, how about that cost of, at the beginning of your upkeep, discard a card? That's a real cost. There's no question that giving up cards to keep this, uh, to have a body on the field is only good if the body is winning the freaking game and doing what it needs to do. It's not bad against a fairy time raveler because at least if they teferi it, you don't discard the card. I guess that's not saying too much though, is it? It's a fairy time raveler is still a pain in the butt. What can you do? Um, and it is kind of a litmus test for the format. Like, can we play a three mana seven six if it just gets bounced by Teferi? <laughs> that sounds insane, but truly, like that's what Time Raveler is doing to us. But I still think we've got to try this card out. We got to see. How often is the fact that it's just a 7-6 going to dominate the game? What does Mono Red do about a clock this fast? What does Mono Red do about something this large? It's a really tough ask. Now, how about if we play in a deck where that discard is not a disadvantage, but is an advantage? How about if we play a deck that somehow reanimates the graveyard using either the uh, bar Bones for Blood... Ah, I already forgot the name of it. Blood for Bones. The, the reanimator spell, Blood for Bones. We could play it in some kind of reanimator deck. We could also play it with cards like uh, Command the Dread Horde to just get it back uh, after we've discarded all those things. We can play it with a bunch of explorer creatures. Maybe Jade Light Ranger fills our handful of land that we won't miss if we throw them in the graveyard. And maybe after we discard all those lands in the graveyard, we get them back with World Shaper. I don't know, but there's got to be some synergy so that the cards that we throw in the graveyard aren't permanently gone. And uh, that could be something to do with this card too. It's an exciting card. And I don't imagine myself not crafting four of these, mostly to see just how much we can make size matter. I think one of the first decks I might play in the release event will be just Llanowar Elf, Rotting Regisaur, and Beef just lots of beef but we'll see how that goes um yeah there's probably some other synergy somewhere like whenever a player discards a card make this happen something of that nature but i'm really really i'm just thinking play this quickly and beat down so uh look forward to seeing just how much damage we can do with rotting regisaur in the near future Marauding Raptor is one in a red for a dinosaur rare. Creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Cre that's all creature spells, by the way. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Marauding Raptor deals two damage to it. If a dinosaur was dealt damage this way, Marauding Raptor gets plus two plus zero oh until end of turn. So right away we have this cost, which is basically any time a creature enters the battlefield, it's going to take two damage from your Marauding Raptor. So you don't want to have a lot of small creatures. Can you play this in a deck with Llanowar Elves? Your Llanowar Elf might just die if you cast it after the Raptor, for example. That's not a very good thing. 
So there's definitely a deck building cost to what is a very reasonable body with a really neat ability to reduce the cost of all the creatures that you play. Let's have a look at some of the things we could be doing with this. Ripjaw Raptor is a pretty obvious synergy with Marauding Raptor. They're both raptors, of course they'll get along. For three mana instead of four, your Ripjaw Raptor comes down, enrages, so you draw a card immediately when the Raptor deals two damage to it, and the Marauding Raptor becomes a 4-3 that you played on turn two that can now go smash opponent's face. That's some pretty solid stuff if you're up against another deck that relies on damage. A 4-5 Ripjaw Raptor is a very good body. However, if you're up against a deck full of uh, removal spells, then you may need something a little more resilient and harder hitting than a Ripjaw Raptor. How about a Nullhide Ferox? For 3 mana, this can come down and be a 6-6 Hexproof. The Marauding Raptor will deal 2 damage to it, but nothing bad will really happen. The opponent won't be able to target it anyway. The Marauding Raptor won't get the bonus, but you'll have a bigger body over here that the opponent needs to answer right away and can't quite deal with with Teferi Time Raveler, which is a big deal. So Marauding Raptor can play in a Dinosaur and Rage deck where a lot of people would want to try it right away, but it can also play in any creature deck, and I feel a need to stress that because I think a lot of people will miss that clause on the card and immediately throw it into a dinosaur deck. Let's talk about the giant elephant-like dinosaur, dinosaur-like elephant in the room in Polyraptor. I've already received DMs on Twitter and Discord with people freaking out about the possible synergy between this being a two-card combo that makes infinite dinosaurs. And what every one of those people has missed so far and what you at home have definitely not missed because you are the most intelligent and greatest of the magic players but what maybe somebody you know might have missed and you can tell them about is that this is this loop doesn't end you can't stop it this ability the enrage whenever polyraptor is dealt damage create a token that's a copy of polyraptor this is not a may ability and this Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, Marauding Raptor deals two damage to it, is not a May ability. This means that when you play Polyraptor, Marauding Raptor will deal two damage to it, making a new Polyraptor, which will be dealt two damage by Marauding Raptor, which will make a new Polyraptor, which will be dealt two damage by... You get the idea. But it doesn't end. It's going to keep happening. At no point do you get to stop and say, okay, I have enough Raptors now, ha ha ha, I'm going to attack with them. No, instead, you're going to draw the game. That's it. You're going to take like half an hour of everybody's time and you're going to draw the game. Not great. I guess it's better than a loss if you're playing hyper competitive ranked or something, but it's not where you want to be. If you're going to do this combo, you absolutely have to have a way to mix some damage into the combo. Let's see if we can find something like that. Okay, I... I looked far and wide. There isn't that much in standard. There isn't a card that, like, every time a creature enters the battlefield, deal one damage to any target or something like that right now. No pandemonium effect. Uh, but we do have it this simple. So, light, you, I, just in response to the trigger after you feel you've made enough volley raptors, lightning strike your own marauding raptor. Pew. Blow up your own Marauding Raptor. You just have to have 10, or no, 9, because of the cost reduction of the Raptor. You have to 9 total mana. 7 for the Polyraptor and 3 for the Lightning Strike. But there you go. We kind of did it. Throw in a Regisaur Alpha and all those Raptors gain haste. So I guess combo nerds get to work. Next, we're going to quickly talk about some Hydras. Gargos the Vicious Watcher is 3 green, green, green. Legendary Creature Hydra. Rare. Vigilance. Hydra spells you cast cost four less to cast. Whenever a creature you control becomes the target of a spell, the Vicious Watcher fights up to one target creature you don't control. Pretty neat card. And the four less to cast is a huge cost reduction. The 8-7 Vigilance body is tremendous. This is one of those things that pushes the boundaries of how big a creature needs to be before the dies to removal clause is a problem. Also, the fact that when it becomes the target of a spell, it can fight another creature you don't control means that even if they point some kind of a cast down at it, it can take a creature down with it. I wish it... I, 
I wish it was spell or ability. I also wish it could fight a planeswalker. Then it would actually be relevant, as I'm not sure if it will be, even with these amazing stats, but it's kind of fun to think about how it can combine with other Hydras. Voracious Hydra is green green X trample. When it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, it's an 0-1 to start with. You can play it for zero and just have an 0-1 out there. And it is a rare. Uh, when the Voracious Hydra enters the battlefield, double the number of plus one plus one counters on the Hydra. And Vish Voracious Hydra uh, fights target creature you don't control. Fights target creature you don't control. So that's an enter the battlefield option. If you play this for two and then green green, it comes in as a two three that can fight another creature or you can double the counters and it becomes a four five. If you have a Gargos Vicious Watcher on the battlefield, it costs four less to cast, which, um, I mean, let's say you have six mana then total. You play this for four, and then another four is eight, and so it would have eight counters, and you could double that and have a 16, 17. <laughs> so some of this is pure nonsense and things like that. I also throw out Hungering Hydra because it has a pretty low cost for a Hydra that can get the extra four body. If you have seven mana, you can play the Vicious Watcher, and then you can pay one and get the four cost discount on this so that you also immediately have a four four. That's not terrible. But there is one more Hydra to consider. Ah, Hydroid Crassus. Now that is the type of Hydra you want a cost reduction on, gaining more life, drawing more cards. So this isn't the tag team that Nyssa, who shakes the world, and Hydroid Crassus quite is, but it does give me kind of a Hydra tribal hope that maybe we can do something fun with our little Hydra friends and a whole bunch of mana creatures. So. Uh, let me know in comments, is Hydra Tribal something you're looking forward to? Is it something I should try out in the format? Let me know. Nightpack Ambusher is two green green rare wolf with flash. It is a 4-4. Four, four. Other wolves and werewolves you control get plus one plus one. At the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast a spell this turn, create a 2-2 two, two green wolf token. So, Nightpack Ambusher is a uh, kind of an anthem and a lord it works with wolves i love the flash um, the flash makes this a whole different critter if the opponent attacks into this and you get to eat one of their creatures and then go on to make some wolves the swing in the game can be very dramatic the card advantage can be excellent and let's pair it up with our buddy the friend to wolves tulsimir this card says that when every wolf enters the battlefield under your control you gain three life and that creature fights up to one creature you don't control. So potentially gain three life and kill a thing. So if you have this on the battlefield and you night pack ambush, you gain three life, you fight with your four four. The next turn, like at the beginning of your end step, so only on your end step, but on your turn, if you don't play a spell, the night pack ambusher will generate a two two wolf, which is actually a three three as long as you have the ambusher because of the plus one plus one bonus. You'll gain three life if Tulsimir is on the battlefield and the three three will fight another creature. You don't have to cast more spells. You can just keep using the ambusher. You could also use a card like Vivian Reed to play your creatures on the opponent's turn so that you keep the two twos uh, coming out of the night pack ambusher and you also get to make stuff happen. Frilled Mystic could also fall into this or any other creatures with flash or activated abilities on artifacts like one that we're going to get to in the very near future. Um, but yeah, I like Night Pack Ambusher. It's an interesting ball of stats. How does it fit into the format? How does it play in a world of Teferi Time Raveler and Kai's Wrath and things like that? It's kind of scary. Uh, the idea of getting all your stuff blown up is not ideal. Ramping it out with elves is definitely nice, but then your elves get blown up. But the fact that it's a self-contained powerhouse, so you can just not take action and continue to build your board. The opponent has to deal with it, they have to wrath, they have to do something, or you're just getting free three threes every turn. When they finally do deal with it, um, maybe they can do it right away and you just carry on a normal game. Maybe they can't deal with it right away, you build up some three threes, and you have all these cards in your hand that the opponent hasn't dealt with yet. I feel like the play patterns with this card might be better than I think they are. And this will be a card I probably crap three or four of to try out in a style of wolf green 
maybe Bant, maybe Green White, maybe a uh, blue green flash style deck something else to add to that deck because while that deck had plenty of flash cards it was missing what i would consider key flash threats and this falls right into that wheelhouse for me so we're going to try out some wolf flash tribal in the near future Next up is Season of Growth. Season of Growth is one in a green for an enchantment uncommon. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. Whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you control, draw a card. So does this go in the feather deck? Should we run Naya so that we can play Season of Growth so that we can really pile on the card advantage so if our threats die, we keep the threats coming? The scry one when a creature enters the battlefield is particularly good for this because feather style decks, they have a problem with flooding out on the wrong things. Too many combat tricks, too many creatures, not enough land. Any one of those things is a fail state for that deck and the scry can help to mitigate that. But is this just a good value card anyway? Do we play this in a deck like Green White Tokens, where we have Amara, who we don't want removed? Any place where we're like, well, if they kill our creature, I guess nothing good happens. Um, maybe the wolf that I just reviewed wants a card like Season of Growth in it to get keep the scry going, to keep finding threats. But also, if uh, something is to die, you got something out of it. But what's really you need off the card is the whenever you cast a spell that targets a creature you control draw a card so this kind of pushes you into playing cards that you wouldn't normally play so spells that target creatures you control include usually auras and pump spells generally speaking and those cards are never con quite considered tier one so if you're going to play them, I think you need the right creatures around them. Dreadhorde Arcanist, we already talked about Feather. Um, maybe there's an Aura deck in green-white with the cards that prey on Auras. I know that Auromancy is one of the beginner decks that you get. This looks like it fits right into that deck. Maybe we can build something out of that pile, but I highly doubt it's very competitive. I just think that this is a really cool card to have in the format. I want to try it in a lot of places. Feather and Tokens are the ones that stand out. Elves might be the kind of deck that wants something like this. Is it better than a Shaper's Sanctuary? Maybe, because you're not reliant on what the opponent is doing. It's about what you're doing. So keep Season of Growth in mind, and maybe we'll find a way to really make it pay off, draw a bunch of cards, and keep our draws silky smooth in these creature-oriented decks. Icon of Ancestry is the next card we're going to talk about. This is a three mana artifact rare. When Icon of Ancestry enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. Three in a tap, look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card of the chosen type from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So we've had cards like Radiant Destiny before, and it, it honestly, that card isn't even seeing play right now. Anthems pretty much need to be on a body so that they do something on their own, or they need to be better than that. And this card is better than that. It has a card draw engine stapled onto an Anthem effect so that you can keep finding more of the creatures of the type that you need to make them stronger. That is pretty awesome. And you can put it in any kind of a tribal deck that you might run, but I want to highlight it with a few of the new cards. We just talked about Nightpack Ambusher. This card is, uh, this is great with Icon of Ancestry because not only are you boosting your wolves uh, and you're boosting the Night Pack Ambusher itself. But if you want to get that free 2 2 from the Night Pack Ambusher, you can, during your turn, just activate the Icon of Ancestry and keep building up your hand. It means that your mana isn't dead. It means that your turn isn't dead. If you have an Icon of the Ancestry on the battlefield, you can let the Ambusher keep making you wolves and you can let the icon of ancestry build up your hand so that if you ever want to play something other than the ambusher you can do that it also helps you find more ambushers so you can keep ambushing so i think that that sounds really sweet as a duo soren the imperious bloodlord imperious bloodlord this card has a minus three that puts a vampire creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So if you have Soren on the battlefield and Icon of Ancestry on the battlefield, you can tap three mana and use the icon to look for a vampire card, find the biggest, most awesome vampire you can, and then minus three the Soren to put it onto the battlefield. 
It's a little bit of a mana cheat so that you get your creature right away and get it onto the board. So I like this card a lot. I'm almost certainly going to craft at least three and maybe a fourth to try it out in tribal decks. Definitely vampires and probably wolves. Vampires is near the top of my playlist. Wolves is somewhere in the middle. But I do believe you'll see Icon of Ancestry in one of my decks starting from day one. So this is gotta be one of the better cards in the set, especially if you love tribal themes. And uh, there's not a lot more to say. Let's, let's run it in all of our tribal decks. Elves, humans, warriors, wherever you want it. Go make it happen. Oh yeah, and did I mention that we still have a tribal set in our midst? We have Ixalan for a few more months. So pirates, dinosaurs, merfolk, you can run Icon of Ancestry with those as well. Knock yourself out. Finally, I'm going to talk about the temples, the Scrylands. Scrylands have returned. Scrylands were very popular back in a very different time in Magic, and it was a big deal that we had Scrylands back then, but the format was significantly slower. First, let's talk about what they are, though. Temple of Malady, Malady uh, is a rare, enters the battlefield tapped. When it enters the battlefield, scry one, tap for a green or a black. So this is a dual land. Uh, these rare lands are most certainly going to be popular and important in their time in standard. The question is, do you need to craft them right now? I believe that the current standard is very much about curving out, getting traction, being on the battlefield, casting your spells on time. And if you're going to do that with a multicolor mana base, you need shock lands and check lands. Shock lands say on them that they also count as plains or swamp or forest and island, whatever the shock land is, which means that the check land, like a drowned catacomb, enters the battlefield untapped if you have a breeding pool on the battlefield. No such luck with the temples. This is not a swamp. This is not an island. This doesn't tap for double mana when you tap your Nyssa. This doesn't allow your Drowned Catacomb to enter the battlefield untapped. So it has a pretty negative effect on the mana bases in that way. So is it worth running these right now? Is it worth crafting these right now? If you play a dual color deck that would consider running one or two guild gates because you want your mana to be good, and I run guild gates in a lot of my best of one decks, the hand smoothing algorithm uh, seems to sometimes serve you up hands of three planes and no swamps, for example, then I like running a few guild gates to make sure that doesn't happen. I'd rather run a temple of silence, but should I use my limited rare wild cards to run out and craft that Temple of Silence if I already have an Orzhov Guild Gate sitting there at common, waiting to be used. How valuable is the Scry, really? Scry can be looked at as being worth about half a card to a third of a card, is how I, it's often described. Here's the way that Scry works. You look at the top card of your library. Some amount of the time, you just keep it there. Nothing really happened. You just have the awareness of what you're drawing next turn, but you would have drawn it anyway. Whatever. Some amount of the time, you'll put the card on the bottom, and you'll get a new draw, and that draw will make a difference in the game. That is when the Scryland is at its best. That's when it did a much better thing for you than a Guildgate would have done. And sometimes you will scry, you will put the card on the bottom, and you'll draw a card that is of equivalent value or doesn't actually change or make a difference in the game if you had just drawn the card that was originally on top of your deck anyway. Then your Skyland might as well have been a guild gate as well. So somewhere to about a half to a third of a card is what the Skyland is worth. How much is your rare wild card worth? Well, if you could be crafting something that's better than a third of a card better than something else that you would put in your deck. You should craft something else instead. You should craft a Goblin Chain Whirler so that you can replace that Gutter Snipe because Goblin Chain Whirler is a far superior card in most situations before you craft your Temple of Triumph, if that makes sense. Um, I hope that gives you some idea of whether or not you should be crafting the temples. I will probably craft one or two and I don't know if there'll be a four of in any of my decks anytime soon. It's much more likely that there'll be a two of in my two color decks, uh, a zero of in my one color decks, and maybe a one of or a zero of in my three color decks. 
So once the um, once the sh check lands rotate out in the fall and, and we lose those drowned catacombs and cards like that, the temples will step up. They'll play a bigger role. They'll matter more. But right now, they're role players. You don't have to be in a rush to craft them. But I am excited that they're here. They they were one of my favorite things about that standard format that they were printed in because everybody was playing a whole bunch of scry lands, which meant, meant that your draws were pretty good and your scry decisions were very important. If you were better at scrying than your opponent, it made a big difference in that format. Dawn of Dreams is two blue blue for a rare sorcery. <clears throat> Look at the top seven cards of your library. Put two of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. All right, so it's a dream of fishes. Look at that art. Is this card good? I think it is. I think it is very good. I think it will do much better than I think people think. I haven't heard many people talking about this card being very excited, but we play cards like Chemister's Insight and people want to know if Tamio's Epiphany is good because of Scry 4. This is way better than that. Looking at your top seven and picking out the two that you need the most and putting the rest on the bottom is a really good effect. Now the biggest problem with it is that it's sorcery speed. Yeah, but is that really a problem in a world where Teferi Time Raveler is forcing everything to be sorcery speed? It's not nearly the problem it used to be. A lot of these Esper decks struggle with having the right card at the right time. And many times you can't run too many Elder Spells in, or Command the Dread Hordes in your deck because they're just not good cards in certain matchups. But when you need them, you really need them. And going seven cards deep to find them with Dawn of Dreams is probably exactly what the Doctor ordered. Instead of adding a third Elder Spell or second or third Command the Dread Horde to your Esper deck, add some Dawn of Dreams. Make it more likely that you'll find them when you actually need them, and in the matchups where you don't need them, go get a Kaya's Wrath and blow up your opponent's board, or go get a Teferi and try to run away with the game that way. I think that Dawn of Dreams is excellent, and with the help of Teferi Time Raveler, you can play it at instant speed. So... Look for this to be crafted probably in numbers like two to three, probably not a four of right away, but I could be wrong on that. This could be exactly what you want every turn four to be in a format like the one that we're currently in. So yeah, love this card. Probably one of the more powerful cards in the set, possibly one of the more underrated cards in the set. Be excited if you open this and definitely uh, think about crafting a few if you're an Esper controlling mage type like me. It also may have a home in Nexus, which is not banned in best of three traditional standard. So some people may want to play with that. That's going to bring me to the end of today's episode. Just throwing up here a few of the more impactful cards that I think you might see in the coming weeks. I hope that you've been enjoying these set reviews. Coming up next, we're going to do my top 10, nine, who cares what number, top eight, nine or 10, some amount of cards, pick a number. We're going to do some amount of my top cards from the set. It's going to be a fun little video where I pick out the cards I'm most excited to play. And we're going to do the top three decks that you should craft and try out after Corset 2020 releases. So those two videos are coming up. Do let me know in comments if you enjoy these reviews, if you find them helpful, and don't worry, starting like the day that you're watching this, either today or the very next day, you're going to start seeing videos of me playing with Corset 2020 thanks to the early access event uh, from Wizard Invitation that I got from Wizards of the Coast, hashtag sponsored. Thank you, Wizards, for inviting me to your early access event to play with the cards early. As always, I stream it on Twitch for most of the day, but I make some video content for YouTube so that you have some special YouTube exclusive stuff for all of my fans over here on YouTube. So thank you very much, of course, for being a fan, for sticking with me. It's the slowest part of the year, late June. It's a, it's a time of year when people are on vacation outside, probably doing anything other than watch more video content for magic. So to every single one of you out there watching this video right now, thank you for sticking with CGB through these, uh, through these late June times, this kind of very slow time of the year. I appreciate you a lot. It means a lot to me. And I really want to know, did you enjoy these set review videos? Is this the type of content that you want when a new set comes out? Or do you want me to keep making like gameplay videos with cards that 
are ba quite frankly we've already seen all the cards in standard at this point it's kind of hard to make a new gameplay video but is that what you would prefer i really do want to hear from you because as much as i enjoy what i do on this channel there's no point to it if you're not enjoying it more so thank you very much for watching this video as always i will see you in the next video goodbye